Welcome, and thank you for joining us for the Autumn Tigers Artist Talk with Karen Tam, Tommy Joseph, and Helen Wang. We are excited about this conversation for a few reasons. This is a great meeting of minds for one. Secondly, contemporary art can feel rather opaque and the origin of artworks tough to understand. This is a great opportunity to trace idea sharing and relationship building among artists and colleagues through to the creation of an original piece of art and exhibition thematic. My name is Janelle Poseshnik. I am the curator of contemporary art at the Campbell River Art Gallery. We are grateful to our funders, the Canada Council for the Arts, the BC Arts Council, BC Gaming, and the City of Campbell River for making events like this possible. The Campbell River Art Gallery team acknowledges that we live, learn, and gather daily on the unceded and traditional territories of the Likwata speaking people, the Wiwakai, the Wiwakam, and the Kwika First Nations, whose historical relationships continue to this day. I was born on Treaty 7 territory and lived for uh, quite a long time on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. And it is a gift and I'm very grateful to live on these lands, uh, even as an uninvited guest. And uh, with that ability comes a, a sense of responsibility uh, for allyship that uh, I hope uh, I can work to fulfill uh, each and every day. So I'd like to introduce all of our speakers before we get rolling. Karen Tam is an artist whose research focuses on the various forms of constructions and imaginations of cultures and communities through her installation work in which she recreates spaces of Chinese restaurants, karaoke lounges, opium dens, curio shops, and other sites of cultural encounters. Since 2000, she has exhibited her work and participated in residencies in North America, Europe, and China, including the Deutsche Bourse residency at the Frankfurt de Kurzweil in Germany, the Musée d'Art Contemporain de Montréal in Canada, and the He Shan Ning Art Museum, China, and Victoria and Albert Museum, UK. <clears throat> she has received grants and fellowships from the Canada Council for the Arts, Conseil des Arts du Québec, and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Tam was a finalist for the Prix Louis Comtois in 2017 from the Contemporary Art Galleries Association and the Ville de Montréal. A finalist for the Prix en Art Actuel from the Musée National des Beaux-Arts du Québec in 2016, and longlisted for the Sobe Artwork Art Award in 2016 and 2010. Her works are in museum, corporate, and private collections in Canada, United States, and United Kingdom. Tam lives and works in Montreal and holds an MFA in sculpture from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a PhD in cultural studies from Goldsmiths, University of London. We are delighted to have this exhibition of Karen's and it has been an absolute pleasure to work with her. Helen Wang joined the British Museum staff in 1991 as an assistant to Joe Cribb in the East Asian section of the Department of Coins and Medals. She became curator of East Asian money in 1993. Her work covers a broad range of topics, mostly relating to the collections for which she is responsible, collection history and development of the field, in particular East Asian numismatics, Silk Road numismatics, Sir Oral Stein and his collections, and textiles as money. She was joint honorary secretary of the Royal Numismatic Society from 2011 to 2016, Honorary Vice President from 2018 and is an honorary member of the editorial board of China Numismatics, the journal of the China Numismatic Society. She was elected as an individual member of the International Association for the Study of Silk Road Textiles in 2016. In 2017, she started a web resource, Chinese Money Matters. Her most recent publication in Asia is Asia Collections in Museums Outside Asia, Questioning Artifacts, Cultures, and Identities from 2021. Co-edited with Eastside Carbone, it is the 
Proceedings of the Art, Materiality and Representation Conference held in London in 2018. Wang holds a BA in Chinese from SOAS University of London. She has a PhD in archeology span from University College London, titled Money on the Silk Road, the evidence from Eastern Central Asia to Kirka, AD 800. Tommy Joseph is a Tlingit carver of Eagle Moiti Kaguantan from the Southeast Alaska. He has been actively engaged in Northwest Coast carving since the 1980s as an instructor, interpreter, and demonstrator, and as a commissioned artist. He has produced a wide range of artworks, including 35 foot totems, smaller house posts, intricately carved and inlaid masks, and a wide range of bentwood containers. He also has replicated Tlingit ceremonial atu, treasured objects, and armor. Since the early 1990s, he has been in charge of the carving shop at the Southeast Alaska Indian Cultural Center in Sitka, demonstrating and interpreting Northwest Coast art. In addition, he has been employed by the National Park Service to restore and replicate some pieces in the park's extensive collection of totem poles. In 2007, he was named a Kipi Stroud Fellow and had a solo show at the Alaska Saint Mu State Museum, Rainforest Warriors, that featured his Tlingit armor work in 2013. So I have a set of questions here, um, but I'd also like if you have an additional question or if you want to take it in a different direction, please feel free to do so. It doesn't have to be um, very formal or disciplined in that respect. Um, so let's see here. Okay, so maybe what we'll start off with is um, a question just about Karen's installation, the concept. Um, development um, of the coin suit and then of autumn tigers to help people get a feel for kind of what the overarching themes and ideas are sure sure so um autumn tigers um it, it was i had another idea for what i was going to show um for the exhibition but the past year and a half really I mean, it affected everybody. Um, and, um, you know, I was really, uh, I guess in a way wanted to make work that was my response and expression of um, how I was feeling about uh, the, the huge rise in anti-Asian racism and attacks, um, vandalism of like uh, Chinatown communities, attacks on um, individuals and groups. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's how this kind of, this exhibition came about was, was making work um, uh, in response to that. Um, so some of the works were banners, um, which have slogans like um, success to the revolution or uh, refuse to eat our bitterness. Um, this, this last one, um, there's a, idiot, a Chinese idiom of um, eating your bitterness, of uh, enduring and accepting suffering. And what I'm saying is reject that, that traditional attitude. Um, reject that, that uh, sort of pressure to be the model minority. Spit out the bitterness. Um, and so there's, there's a couple of banners um, like that. Um, another one is like a longevity banner um, that celebrates um, and honors our elders, the elders in our community. Um, and then you know, there's also um, kind of the, I've, I've included um, with the help of, of Janelle and, and the team um, to include historical uh, photographs uh, from the collections of the Nanaimo and Cumberland museums uh, to kind of also make this connection of what's happening today with what happened in the past. Um, you know, whether it be celebrations or um, community events like parades um, or even funeral processions. Um, and as well as uh, creating uh, uh, an installation called CS Wing Studio um, that looks at 
um, early Chinese Canadian photo studios, so photographers. So thinking about how um, they documented our community, you know, who, who was marginalized and not just like the Chinese community, but other um, marginalized communities. So it's very diverse, uh, um, uh, uh, diverse um, sitters. Um, and then, I mean, there's other works like very, very similar in that vein where um, I also made a, what I call the runescape wallpaper that are drawings that are my uh, drawings I made after hearing all these um, stories, news and incidents that has occurred this past year. So attacks in, in Vancouver of the Chinatown lions or of like elder um, of the seniors. Um, and then also drawings of the anti-Asian riots of 1907 um, in Vancouver. So again, just sort of this mix of, of both. Um, one other work, um, which is actually an audio piece that plays throughout the exhibition, um, is, is, is a, a mix of uh, excerpts from Cantonese opera um, taken from uh, 1940s recordings on 78 records, um, as well as Mok um, Yu, songs, Mokyu is a narrative form of, um, of music uh, uh, sung by, in Toisanese. So it was one of the early dialects um, that North American Chinese uh, spoke. Um, and the subject matter is, is about the immigrant experience, about um, the personal experience. Um, so that kind of plays throughout the space. And I think the last work, oh, two, two other works. Um, is a, a mural type of uh, installation uh, made out of cyanotypes called From Yi Wu to You and is looking at sort of the global kind of cultural economic exchanges from China, say through like the Silk Roads, but uh, historical and, and current. Um, so kind of mixing a lot of images, imagery through that. And the last work um, uh, is a coin suit that I made um, this past year that um, was, I was looking at Chinese um, jade burial suit from the Han Dynasty, um, as well as like other kind of sources of inspiration. Um, but I wanted to make my own version that wasn't, you know, wasn't about, um, that didn't have any funeral uh, aspects to it. Um, I was thinking about how do I make my own version of, of sort of these suits, but using Chinese coins. I was thinking about Chinese coins as, um, and the, the early, early Chinese migrants to North America and the um, hardships and, and, and um, sort of experiences of racism that, that, they, that they felt. Um, and uh, I guess, I don't know if I should stop here and continue about how I came about um, to, um, to make it, um, but it was, it was through my research. Well, initially it was through like Google search. So I was like, okay, Chinese coins suit, just to see what popped up. Um, and uh, I, I came across Helen's um, wonderful like website, Chinese Money Matters, um, and one of one or two of um, the entries uh, talked about the Tlingit um, armor, um, and just from there, I just kind of discovered um, for myself. I found out about Tommy's work, so. And we were, we are so um, lucky to have two pieces of uh, Tommy Joseph's work in the exhibition. Um, and we're, it's great because there is uh, a piece of slat armor and then there's also a piece of armor with the coins on it, which is a kind of pre-contact and post-contact conversation in itself. Tommy, would you be able to talk to us about those pieces and, um, just kind of give us some descriptions around your your work with armor. Sure. Um, both of those pieces that you're you're talking. You hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You sound great. 
Okay. Well, both those pieces, the, the wood slat and rod armor and the Chinese coin hide armor, yes, that's uh, post-contact and, and pre-contact, uh, they, were, they were part both part of a, sh- a solo show I had in this Alaska State Museum in Juneau. I had six mannequins in full battle gear. Um, I had uh, five male mannequins and, and uh, a, fee, a female mannequin with, with all, and that, that piece there, uh, the, the Chinese coin armor that I sent to you is, is the female uh, hide coin armor. Um, I had, I had, yeah, it was, it was, uh, the, the state museum, they now own one of those, those warriors that I had in that show. Actually, they own two. They have one in the Sheldon Jackson Museum in Sitka and one in the state museum in Juneau and, and uh, a few other pieces have, Actually, uh, one whole set went to a private collector uh, uh, up in Anchorage, Alaska. Here, so the the wood slat armor uh, traditionally was made of crab apple wood, our hardest wood we have here in in Southeast Alaska. Um, crab apple, which was really really difficult to carve because of all the knots and tiny knots and throughout. But uh, my piece there, I made out of um, alder alder wood, and I believe I used. Uh, hemp cordage in place of my sinew. I, I did make a piece out of out of um, sick of black-tailed deer sinew. It took me seven years to create that one piece because uh, those pieces of sinew out of the backstrap sick of deer are not that big, and and so I had local hunters bringing me the the sinew, and I, every bit of that cordage um, on, on one piece was. Um, let me think. I think 450 yards of material woven into to one one piece, and um, most of the time consuming. But um, the piece you have there is alder and and hemp, and then the the I believe buffalo hide. No, um, sorry, cowhide and and the ch- actual Chinese coins that I I bought off off the internet from China. Awesome. And one of the, I guess, one of the kind of big conversations that um, that we've had and and brought you on to consult for is the um, impacts of the maritime sea trade on uh, Tlingit peoples. And that is um, an important, as important a story to tell as the kind of material reach of the Chinese coins because there are, as we know, there are very devastating consequences to maritime sea trade and then there are also the kind of great impacts of intercultural exchange, the exchanges of technology and information that can also happen. And I was just wondering if you can speak to those um, impacts a little bit, Tommy, and just help us to um, kind of understand um, the impacts on the Tlingit peoples. Sure. Well, the the Russians coming across from Kamchatka uh, up uh, Russia um, along the the Aleutian chain and, and parts of Alaska, they made their way uh, to Sitka, actually all the way down into uh, parts of California. But they they, they made um, their main stay here in Sitka. I think they're here for about fifty years, and it was they were here for the sea otter trade. They're bringing all, all the sea otters. Uh, I mean, they, they, they pretty much decimated the population all around here. They had uh, alleyutes that they brought down to do hunting for them, as well as having local shlingit and, and uh, do hunting for them. And uh, like I said, decimation of, of our sea otter population. But they're taking all these sea otters to, um, well, they had, they had a, a saltry here in Sitka. Uh, the place just uh, a few miles out, out out of town here. I live on an island uh, here in Sitka. Was 14 miles of road. Well, seven miles one way is Old Sitka, and it was an old salt tree out there. They also had a stockade that the Russians did. Had a stockade out there where they, for you know, they, they locked up uh, native or any, any whomever. Um, um, there was a battle out there. It was the Battle of 1802, uh, where the Slingit had um, stormed the dock. Stormed the uh, stockade out there and pretty much killed everybody. Burnt the fort to the ground, which had the salt tree, which where they process all the sea otters to get them ready to put them on ships to ship them to China, where they were getting the most money for the sea otters. And in in doing so, coming back with all these Chinese coins, that's how 
the Chinese coins got to our shores uh, through through the Russian fur trade with our our our, 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 our sea otters, and they, they come back here where they had no monetary value to the Slinget, but uh, having a handy hole in the middle, um, realized real quick that you could sew that to a hide. And I explained earlier, I took them seven years of making cordage for one piece of, of slat armor, uh, just to have enough to, to weave it all together. Um, well, having a handy hole in the middle, you can layer like chain mail uh, or, or even spaced out, or I saw them in chevron patterns, but uh, it would take a whole lot less time to sew all that onto um, onto your leather and, and, and create the armor. That, that's how, um, yeah, the, the um, transition from the wood slat rod armor to the um, uh, hide and coin armor. Thank you so much, Tommy. And um, so Helen, you are the curator of East Asian coins at the British Museum. And um, I'd love to just talk a little bit about uh, your website where Karen was able to uh, find information on Tommy's work, but also um, your um, area of expertise about the kind of far or the implications of finding Chinese coins across the globe and how we can talk about uh, the reaches of material culture through that. That's a, that's a very big question. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of the, the, the website, the blog that Karen is talking about, this is a very small thing. It's, it's, a, it's a bit occasional, a bit sporadic, and it's often just for interesting things that I don't have enough information or enough knowledge or enough time to work up into a proper article, but it's of interest and I think it's it would be nice to make the information known in a way. So um, this particular post came about because my then head of department was in Canada and he either texted me or emailed me with, with a message that said, I'm in the Canadian Art Museum. Is this a well-known thing? And it was a it was a photograph of one of these leather waistcoats with the coin sewn onto it. And I messaged back and said, he said he'd never seen them before. And I said, yeah, it is a well-known thing. So that he, my head of department doesn't know what it is. Okay, well then I will, I will find out a little bit of information so that it's there and recorded. So I put it down. And when I was doing a little bit of research, I came across the work of Tommy Joseph and was intrigued. Um, so I saw information, he'd been, he'd given a TED talk about his work, he'd given, there was information about an exhibition, and there were a few other bits and pieces that I found out about. So I put down what I knew, then there is, if you find it, if you go to Chinese Money Matters, you'll see it. And then a few people came in with some comments, somebody from Poland came in with comments, my, another colleague came in with comments. And it was quite nice to, to, to generate a bit of discussion. And then it kind of went a little bit quiet and nothing happened until, until earlier this year when a book was published. This book is called Asian Collections, Asia Collections in Museums Outside of Asia. And this is the proceedings of a conference that took place in June, 2018. Um, it was a big anthropological conference. Um, part of it was taking place in London in the UK. And there was one study day was about Asia collections in museums outside of Asia, but organized by Isabel Carbone. And uh, Karen and I were both speakers at this conference, and we that's where we met. And we were talking. Uh, Karen did a very interesting presentation about uh, Ashley and Petit Chinois, an, an, an exhibition that she'd done previously. And I was talking um, basically a bee in my bonnet. It's, you know, Chinese money matters, so why does it have such a low profile was the title of my paper, which was essentially to say, if you, if you only think about museum collections as art pieces, then you are missing very significant collections, including money collections, because money, often people don't associate money with art. Well, we can debate that, but it's, it's, it's an issue. And Karen then, I think you had a few days in London after the conference and she came to see me and I showed her some of the collection. Little did I know that, you know, three years later, she would produce and send me this photograph of a jade suit made of coins, which was just 
phenomenal. So, you know, I, I would love to know more about really the, the thinking behind this and really what you want to say by using the Chinese coins and where you got the coins from. Well, uh, I guess I'll, it's it's a bit mundane, but I did get the coins online. Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess like just just talking to you, um, you know, and, and hearing your presentation, the time which has really got me thinking, and 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 just uh, just like I've got to do this, I've got to make this sculpture, um, and. I guess in one sense, as I mentioned, it was in a way paying homage to these early Chinese uh, immigrants. Um, but I was also thinking, you know, with this past year of how um, the coin suit, when you wear it, you can't really wear it because it's so heavy. Um, the weight of it, it's like the weight of, you know, all, all the hardships um, that the early um, migrants um, faced and experienced. But at the same time for like this past year and going forward, um, it can also act, and I'm thinking of numismatic charms, um, you know, the protective um, um, uh, uh, charms and how the coin suit can also act like a, like an armor, a protection. And it, I guess this ties in with the, the title of the show of Autumn Tigers and how tigers in Chinese culture is a symbol of power, of strength, um, but also that they ward off evil spirits. Um, and so that's that's kind of how it came about. And um, in kind of weaving, I'm, I'm not sure, I guess weaving or, or connecting the coins together, I, I was looking at um, those coin swords. Um, my, my family has a few. So I was just, you know, really looking deeply into that and how they were attached. Um, and kind of that's, that's where this, this work came from. So is that how you decided how to link them together was by looking at the coin swords? Because you've um, sewn them together in a really unique fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because I, I, I mean, the, some of the, the, the sections of my parents, like the coin swords, like, I could tell that the, the string was kind of getting a bit iffy. <laughs> um, and so I was trying to think of ways of how to attach them or tie them together um, so that, you know, hopefully in, if they last, you know, 20, 40, 60, whatever years, that um, they wouldn't fall apart. And I recall from reading Helen's article that um, uh, you talk a little bit about those coin swords. Is that correct? And then in, in another post, we talk about coin swords. Um, do you know what a coin sword looks like? From your, a, oh, yeah, please. Can you describe it? Well, it's like a, if you think of a metal rod, sometimes actually they are like umbrella spokes. I think I think I've seen one that's made of an umbrella spoke. And so you have a long thing piece and then you have the Chinese coins sort of arranged like a sandwich with the, the, the rod in the middle and they're sewn on together. Then there will be a hilt, sometimes a few maybe ball shapes or three or four or five pieces on strings that hang off them. And um, it's quite interesting because these are things that are immediately recognized. And once you've seen one, you know what one looks like. And in the British Museum, we had one of these in the handling collection that people could handle and could touch in one of the galleries. And it was quite interesting because it's our volunteers who, who operate the handling desks. And the volunteers sometimes feed back to us and tell us what's been going on, what the comments are, what the feedback is. And they said, with this particular object, with the coin sword, people who were, who were from a Chinese heritage who saw this, often their first response was to walk away and not to go anywhere near it, as though it was something that was maybe dangerous. And anybody who was, you know, people who looked like me, <laughs> um, if they came close to the scene, they wanted to see it and they wanted to touch it. So there was this kind of attraction from one group of people and a, and a kind of like 
a complete withdrawal from from another group of people. I mean, this is just a very a very crude description of how people of behavior in the galleries. And they said this was this was very very you know this was most noticeable on this particular object, not from any other object at all. Um, unfortunately, then as Karen says, they tend the strings tend to come a little bit loose, so we had to remove that one from from the handling. But there's a stark responses there. There are several of these in, in museum collections around the world. Recently, there was a survey of Chinese collections in Scotland, in museums in Scotland, and quite a lot of the museums in Scotland have coin swords. It's, it's quite a, a strange a strange thing to collect, but uh, they're there. Hmm. Can I ask? Oh, yeah, sorry, please. Can I ask Tommy um, for the sort of the, the use of the coin, uh, the Chinese coins in the armor? Um, so you mentioned that they they actually provided more um, like physical or in a chat we had on the phone. Um, you mentioned that they um, provide protection against um, sort of like in in battle um, against I guess bullets um, in in other um, <coughs> arms. Um, and I was wondering if they might also have. Um, a symbolic function to at all or, or not? You know, I, I, I've i seen, other than um, coin armor, I've seen use of coins in some large Chinese coins used in and various masks and different museum collections um, used as eyes and and on headdresses and um, used in other other and those those would be more of ceremonial objects but for the for the hide armor or the, the yeah the hide armor with the, the Chinese coins um, I, I, that that's more for hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat close with uh, your your daggers every warrior here had a had a dagger slung from his shoulder and neck um, um, uh, you know 14. 14 to 16 inches long, usually a long double-edged blade uh, um, dagger. So, um, yeah, I got lost here for a second. I'm not, what, what was the question again? Oh, it was just like if, if they also had another sort of ceremonial or symbolic perp or function. Right. Uh -huh. um, on other objects, yes. And, and, but, but all the hide armor, uh, that was, that was, um, they, Actually, the it was the wood flat armor that was used with um, usually two 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 ply uh, of hide arm armor under the flat armor that would stop that was noted to have stopped a musket ball. Mm, wow, um, and then I guess like in terms of um, since there the coins have the hole the square hole in the middle, then when when they were um, sewn into the hide, um, would they have like overlap so that, you know, so that the, I, I guess there'd be more? Yeah, um, they're not, they're a lot of, I, I, I think I, I saw more that had chevron patterns, like two rows side by side with a little space. So that, but then there were other, other um, uh, pieces that had entire overlapped where, where every inch, uh, and those, those are really, heavy heavy like you're saying the i mean the weight of your um of the the, the big piece um uh, uh yeah they're, they're they are quite heavy but uh, uh there's just a few of them that i saw that had that many coins overlapped there, there was one one that that was armor that i believe it's up in the anchorage museum right now i first saw it in the smithsonian one of the smithsonians over uh actually in Suitland, Maryland, out, outside of DC, and it had shark teeth, a row of shark teeth, like uh, great white teeth, and then and some fringe, and then a row of Chinese coins, and then a row of shark teeth, and a row of Chinese coins, and and so forth, just row after row on this on this, uh, and it was a piece of, it was a shirt, but it, it had um, I think the fewest coins on there. It looked it looked real impressive, but uh, um, um, yeah, I'm not going to stop a musket or or many of the daggers, but also they were two ply, like I said, so it's hard to get a dagger through one piece of, of that heavy hide, hide there. Um, and just going back, Helen, I was just wondering if you could um, speak a little bit to what the kind of presence of Chinese coins, um, how that um, 
that presence across the globe um, relates to the kind of reach of Chinese material culture and the movement of that? I know you said that that's a kind of big question. Um, I mean, it, it, it varies at different times of history. Um, at times when there have been very strong dynasties, like the Han Dynasty, you get a lot of Chinese coins that will be uh, that were taken up to the northwest of China, maybe further further afield, also in Korea, down to Vietnam, what's now Vietnam, what's now Korea. Um, and uh, again, in the Tang Dynasty, when it's, again, another very strong empire, there's a lot of coins being produced. You get coins that go right into into Central Asia, into Uzbekistan, um, and further afield. And you also get people, so other, other, other kind of kingdoms are following and copying, because the thing, the thing with the Chinese coin, if it's round with a square hole and it has a four character inscription, so at the north, south, east, and west of the hole, is that if you see one of these things and you know it's a coin, it's basically saying, I am a coin. I'm a, round, I'm a piece of metal, I'm round with a square hole in the middle, I'm a coin. So, you know, whichever language or whichever script or whatever you're coming from, if you want something to look like a coin, it doesn't have to look like a Roman coin or a Greek coin, it can look like a Chinese coin because it's essentially the piece of metal is saying, I'm a coin. Um, so you get you get some coins that were issued in Sogdia, um, some coins that were issued. Um, you, you can get some coins in. Uh, you get some coins that have from Mongolian territory, sort of ancient Mongolian territory, and elsewhere that have uh, this. They, they will take the form and they will use the square hole as part of their their tanga, their, their maybe their their tribal or their people's symbol. Um, later on in history, you start getting a lot of the, the Chinese moving down into Southeast Asia. They're looking for tin. So maybe they'll go to Java and elsewhere and you'll get coins that are round with a square hole with a, uh, a slightly slightly wonky kind of an inscription or they'll be round with a round hole and maybe a, um, a local inscription. Um, so you, you get things happening at different times. Um, also, in the Ming Dynasty, you have a lot of ships. The Admiral Zheng He is going further west, so you get coins found sort of throughout Southeast Asia, sort of up in India, you get them found in the Gulf, you get them found on the east coast of Africa, so you, you, you get them found, they're found all over the place. But, you know, one of the things we have to be careful with is that just because a coin is of, say, 11th century or 12th century, according to the inscription, it doesn't mean that it moved in the 11th century or the 12th century, because some of these coins remained in circulation in strings of coins all strung together until the early 20th century. So we have to be a little bit careful about the context in which these, these coins are found. I mean, this is what you know, makes it really interesting about the, the coins that, that are found on the, the Klingit armor is that um, I'm not completely up to date with the research on this, but mostly the coins are before the Qianlong Emperor, they're before 1735. So if they're all before 1735, then those coins, did they arrive at that time or did they arrive later? If they arrived later, then we would expect there to be some coins of the Qianlong Emperor, so from who had a very long reign. But there, if there are none of those, then they probably came earlier because it's almost inconceivable that there wouldn't have been any of those coins if they had, if they had arrived later. So again, there are a lot of questions there that need to be answered. Um, and to be to be addressed, but you know, I'm not of the area, so I have to be a little bit careful as to how I interpret the data because you know Tommy knows has done a lot more research on this kind of material, and he knows this material much better than I do. So I don't know if Tommy has any any views on the dates. Um, you know, I I don't. Um, I. I photographed um, every piece of coin armor that, that I come across. I, I've been to the British Museum uh, and the British store, uh, um, uh, or St. Petersburg, Russia, and the Kunstkomra Museum, every museum that I, I travel to, and all the Smithsonian's on the East Coast, there were, I think, uh, uh, of the United States, there were 19, or there were 19 affiliated Smithsonian museums on the East Coast, and I got to go through 10 of those museums and their collection facilities. Some were in the building, in the attic, in the, in the basement next door, or even the state next door. Just uh, incredible uh, collections. And, um, 
and I have not, I'm not, I'm not an expert on the Chinese coins, but I have lots of photos to compare and try to look at and figure out the, the, the dynasty, the, the, the time. I know the, the ones that I use in my, uh, I had two sources that I, I found a reproduction of Chinese coin, uh, uh, company in California. And I, I, I bought 1150 of those and used those on on a couple of pieces and then the one that in the piece that you have uh, are ones that i actually bought from china i have no idea what uh dynasty or uh, time period those are from but uh it's definitely something that i i am curious about and want to know you know really um the time period of, of all those and and when they came in i we know when they came in but i really are they old and new or what what um what, what you're saying is the, the later coins are, are I, I I don't know, but uh, I, um, yeah, it definitely sparks the interest there. Can I ask? Um, is there a, is are there different materials used for the different dynastic coins, um, or even like the thickness um, of them? Um, you know, there, there there are definitely different thicknesses in these. Like all the reproduction ones I got are are, are like uh, maybe a third the thickness of of the actual ones that I get from China. They're all stamped out, made out of brass, and but all all the different they various ones that I, I have like um, I think three strings of these um, deeply green uh, oxidized um, coins. Uh, some some definitely are. are twice as thick as others and some a little, little wider rounding and I can I, I've laid them all out and try, try to um, see the differences in them uh, I have no idea what any of the characteristics mean though <laughs> and Helen could could you could you say a bit about the material that was used um so the very early ones it'll be a it'll be the there'll be some kind of a copper alloy copper and tin Sometimes they'll be lead. Um, later on, you start to get the brass brass coins, and you can tell from the difference. You can tell by looking at them. I mean, if you can see on on these coins, most of them will either have a two character inscription um, on either side of the the hole, or they'll have a four character inscription, um, so from north, south, east, and west of the hole. If they have the four character inscription, the top one and usually the bottom one. Will give you usually will give you the rain period so the rain period will maybe be for anything from one year to maybe 60 years um so you can identify them them for basically to 60 years or to one year usually something like that um and if you can read them you tend to go for the inscription if you can't read them you tend to go for how thick they are what the metal looks like what kind of metal it looks to be made of look at the rims the outside rims I know how wide they are, how thin they are, and look at the the rim around the hole in the middle. So the look at the 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 how 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 that one has been produced, and you can also look at the the treatment of the characters, the style of calligraphy that is on on the coins as well. I'm glad that Tommy, you said that there were some reproductions because I think there are some reproductions on this piece, um, but. Uh, you know that already. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm curious also to know, you know, when you were, when you were, you were, tell me, when you were sewing them onto the, onto the leather and Karen, when you were sewing them together, did you use the same kind of technique to, to, to to and the same kind of material or you know did you use a material a kind of a string that would last a long time or did you use a material that will not last a long time well when i was doing mine i was um trying to use a strong durable um, because of, um especially on the reproduction ones the reproduction coins were a little a lot rougher on the inside square uh hole was, was a lot rougher uh, so I wanted to use a heavier thread that was was not gonna gonna break. Um, I know I I tried a few different things. I tried linen thread. I used um, 
uh, actual sinew and imitation sinew, uh, imitation sinew work, work really well. And did, did it ever occur to you to use something that was invisible, something like, you know, like fishing line or did it have, did it have to be something that was a, an organic material? Um, was that important to you? Or was it important that the stitching is visible? Mostly I, I used organic material and I wasn't trying to, to uh, cause, cause every piece I saw, uh, except for the overlap ones, the overlaid ones, uh, that was almost like a snake skin uh, armor. Um, um, you couldn't really see the thread on, the, on those too much, but uh, on the, uh, the ones that were just sewn flat, you could definitely see where the thread went in and, and then back out and then back over, over the edge. Uh, like, so it takes four holes to hold down one coin or the, the, the one beside is a joining hole to the next coin. Yeah. And Karen, was it important to you what the, what the material that you stitched um, it was? Somewhat uh, to like to a certain degree, I tried at first with copper wire just because, um, you know, I was thinking with the jade suits, the jade um, pieces were, I think they use silver, silver or gold. Um, and uh, well, I, I wasn't going to test out with, with those materials. So I just used copper wire and it just didn't feel right um, for, for this piece. Um, and I felt like, you know, just looking at the, the coin swords that with that kind of red string. Um, so I tried to find something that was durable that was that red. So I, I settled on something uh, like a strong nylon um, red string uh, that I think they use in Chinese knotting. Um, at least that's what it said on the description on the online shop. <laughs> Is it, um, is, it the, is it the shiny the shiny one that's quite soft yeah. yeah oh no no not that one sorry no not that, because that one i was afraid that um with the friction um with the 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 hole in the coin that it might kind of eventually i mean, I, I think you really have to try to cut it um but yeah, so that's what I did with, with kind of weaving it, to, to tying the coins together. And then um, what you see kind of coming out are these other um, just red cotton um, uh, um, fabric, um, sort of like, uh, oh, what is it called now? Double bias tape um, that I used. So that actually when it comes um, everything is kind of flat. Um, it, it's usually just laid out flat. And I, I saw images of how some of these um, jade suits um, would have been packed. Um, so they're just flat and then kind of cr created uh, the, the support form underneath. And so using these, uh, the, the cotton um, fabric to tie um, the ends together um, is what it, what it's like here. I don't know if I described that well. <laughs> how 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 did you work out how to make it, and how did you actually? It, it's quite a heavy thing to sew together. How did you? So I mean, did you have a model that you that you based it on, or how did it work? Um, I I used my partner and my dad um, <laughs> <laughs> to kind of figure out the the size or the length of things. Um, Right now, this is uh, in five parts. So you know, one for the leg, one for each leg, the body, and the the two arms. Um, and it was just kind of just starting at you know. I think for for all of them, I started at the top um, of each piece, and then just kind of uh, I guess very organically worked out. Um, how many coins that I needed to cover basically the arm, um, the full arm um, and the length of it too. I mean, did, did, you make, did you make your partner and your dad lie down or? Um, not up? at first. At first it wasn't heavy enough and it wasn't long enough, but eventually I, I did because it was hard to hold the coin um, you know, with gravity. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
so I, I asked him to lie down and then um, kind of just measured it that way. And, and did you wait at the end to see how heavy it was? I did. I did. I don't remember how much it weighs, but I waited so I could tell Janelle and the shipping company. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it was pretty heavy. Yeah. I think it's it's a it's a really remarkable thing that you've done there. It's you know it's like I think the I received your email with the photograph and said, oh, Helen, I wonder if you might be interested in this. And <laughs> I think I went home and spent the entire weekend thinking, like, I don't believe this. This is just amazing. I can't. It never occurred to me that this could ever happen, and it's just such a a brilliant piece, you know, not just the, you know, the making of it, but also the, the meaning of it and the significance of it. Mm. And I'd, I'd, I'd really love to know what Tommy thinks of it. I, I think I saw one, one image of it um, a while ago. I'm sorry, I, I don't have my, my computer crashed and, and uh, then I got hacked some years ago. I've not actually checked an email in over seven years. So I, I have to go and you um hit my wife up to to see so i i i have one one small picture from her phone of it um and so i i'm i'm curious about how many coins are on this piece it's such a grand piece mm -mm -mm. um i kind of lost count <laughs> ago, but, but what i did was um the coins came in i don't know why they came in packs of 80 and not like a hundred so I right. saved all the pack, the, all the empty packages. So I figured I would just count how many packages there were, but I don't know at the moment. Just a yeah. lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> because I think on the on the the real the jade suits themselves, I think they have something between say 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 pieces each of the small rectangular pieces of jade. Usually they're rectangular. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're triangular and I think with jade being such a hard surface a hard material to carve that's probably why they have the straight edges I assume I don't know but you know they have the straight edges so it's it's kind of really cute. and then when they have the, at the corners to sew them together they have little round holes so they have four little round holes at the corners or mm. I guess three if they're triangular <laughs> yet on your piece they're round with a square hole so they're completely reversed in the shape it's it's, it's brilliant it's just fantastic Thank you. Oh, what, what are you working on now, Tommy? What sort of things are you working on? Well, I, I just um, seven days ago finished my current totem pole, uh, pole uh, reproduction pole for our, our um, Sitka National Historical Park. And the uh, day after tomorrow, I'm taking off to Ketchikan, another town on another island 200 miles down the coast i'm doing i'm a wood conservator also so i'm i'm working on an old an old totem pole that uh, is down and needs needs some some repair recreation treatment and then we're going to put it back up i'll be down there for two weeks doing that job i just uh throughout this pandemic time like I have a 20 foot dugout canoe in my front yard, almost complete. I just need a, maybe a week's worth of time to, to um, really work on it and I'll be ready to steam it open. Well, I thought during the pandemic lockdown time, I was going to do that. And I got distracted by another log, ended up doing a whole month, bunch of satire art, entirely different from anything I've ever done before, which has to do with the former president and and his his uh, political views and things like that. So I, I I did a bunch of satire math, and then I got into uh, doing the uh, N95 uh, mask a mask cover a wooden cover that covers your, this is my most recent. I I have ten of a mask uh, portrait mask that cover. I do one, uh, two of my wife and two of myself, and then also clan clan animals, uh, bears and and um other other uh, eagle raven thunderbirds um that are uh, they fit right over the the n90 they're red or excuse me yellow cedar and you would that really thin shells that fit over the n95 mask and actually the n95 is what holds it onto your face so it's a mask cover over a mask cover 
that's where I'm at. So look forward to seeing those. Can we see them anywhere? Um, I, I only have them on my um, pictures on my phone. I haven't displayed them anywhere uh, on my Facebook page. I did. I, I had um, a ridicule poll with with our former president and, and all his um, well, my political stuff. Um, so, anyways, it, on my Facebook page, I guess is the only place I I showed it, and it's possibly going to be in the show. All those things in the show um, down the road that's under development right now. So I'm not sure uh, right now. They're just in my possession, in in shopping bags, and I'll be taking the catch can with me when I go in a couple days. Well, we are very glad to catch you before you go on your journey. Um, I, Karen, um, you're also involved in a lot of projects right now. Actually, your screen background is a project that you've just opened. I was wondering if you wanted to talk to that a little bit. Sure. So um, behind me, my, my virtual background, um, it's a, a public art project that, that um, that's open for its temporary public art project in Montreal Chinatown. That's a commission by the Quartier des Spectacles, where I collaborated with the designer um, called Jean de La Salle um, in creating a public space. Um, there's been this uh, empty lot in Chinatown ever since I was a kid, maybe like even longer. Um, so at least at least 30, 40 years. Um, and um, so this was a wonderful opportunity um, to kind of create something where, you know, it's to show, well, for me at least, to show alternatives um, to, you know, real estate development, to those, uh, like con those types of um, kind of construction projects and such. So what we what we have in this public space, I, I was thinking of, of it like um, concentric circles. You know, the idea of the circle as something that um, that's uh, you know centers around the family about, and of centers around community. Um, so on an outer ring, we have flags where the colors are um, taken from Cantonese opera. Um, costumes and stage uh, stage props, and then within that, like this, the the next circle in, um, we have a night market um, that's that will launch in in August, kind of to 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 imit to be in a way like the Asian night markets, um, and that would support the local um, businesses, um, restaurants, and and such. Um, Within that is another circle, which is kind of like a more family and friends to share food, um, whether it's from the market itself or bringing their own food and, and sharing that. And um, and then the inner circle, uh, it's a little cheesy, but the heart of the space um, is a tree. Um, so this is what behind me and I'm ca it's called the wishing tree. Um, referencing to the wishing trees that you would find outside of Buddhist temples across Asia, um, and that people would um, write wishes on red pieces of paper, um, attach them to oranges, for example, or plastic oranges, um, throw them up in the tree, and if they get caught in a branch, then your wish will come true. Um, and so what I've done, there's about 1,300 or 1,400 um, wishes that I've written, handwritten with my parents and, and some assistants um, of just seven Chinese characters. Uh, resilience, strength, health, fortune, um, prosperity, uh, happiness. And I always forget the seventh one, um, but there's a seventh one. And it's basically wishes for the continued growth and survival of Chinatown, wishes for our elders, um, especially during this past year. Um, and so it's open day and night. Um, there's a stage that we uh, constructed underneath where um, we've programmed uh, different events and performances. And I'm working with the city, or sorry, working with the Quartier des Spectacles to see how, how else we can activate the space and really bring in um, community groups who want to just use it, for example, for classes, for rehearsals or anything like that. So, yeah. <laughs> 
beautiful. It's wonderful, Karen. What are you working on? I've just been this I've just this week finished an article which is looking at textiles as money. Um, so looking it's called the fabric of the fabric of banknotes and so sort of textiles in and on uh, on paper money because some some paper money has we think of it as being paper but actually it has a very high um, textile fiber content maybe cotton or linen or flax and then you know in the early Chinese paper money it's made of mulberry mulberry bust fibers and then also looking at it the other way looking at the paper money that has images of textiles on it either in the background design or has images of textile technology or textile production so of looms or spinning or um, you know, sort of industrial mechanization productive forces often emancipation of women occasionally men but mostly women in these pictures and how sometimes the textiles that are on the banknotes are representing the identity of particular countries like the the new 2000 song note of Uzbekistan has Hon Atlas uh, textiles on it. These are kind of like, you know, the woven designs, a little bit like E-cut, but very woven designs with specific images on them. And mostly we ignore these because we don't really pay very much attention to the money that we use. I mean, in Canada, you know, could you, could you, could you describe the coins that you use in Canada and the banknotes that you could use in Canada without having a little sneak look first? I mean, you know, <laughs> often people can't, as long as it looks right, they're happy to use it. And the same with the banknotes, you know, every single, every single thing that goes onto a banknote or into a coin is intentional. Everything is intentional. It's very small, but very intentional. And yet it's just, you know, it's designed to be something that you really ignore. Um, you just get on with it and use it. And that's really all we want to know is that it, it will work. We don't really, don't really care usually what's on it unless you're, into that kind of thing. Um, but every day, most people don't really remember what's on the notes. So looking at the textiles and the banknotes, actually, if, if you start looking at the, the kind of the documentation of what's on the notes and what goes into the, the design of the notes, um, they will tell you what the key image is or who, if there's a portrait of somebody, who the portrait is of, but they won't tell you necessarily the background design because maybe you're not supposed to notice, maybe it's too much information for the, for the ordinary reader, uh, maybe it's part of the security features, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I've been working on, just finished this week. That is really uh, fascinating, just thinking about how, um, I mean, a lot of uh, painted European and, and actually other cultural portraits are often used to um, discuss the wealth and fortunes of the sitter or where they've made their money, what type of um, uh, maybe materials that they've sold or traded if you're looking at kind of aristocratic or wealthy individuals. Um, there's all these um, often, yeah, quite subtle clues that are within portraits, even um, you know, kind of the direction um, that the folks face. I was reading uh, an article by Faith Musang, who also did a large project on uh, Chinese photographers. And she was talking about- that. What's that? I think I just read that article too. My first son from the yeah. book. <laughs> I was so fascinated by how she said that the sitters because a lot of times like a portraiture is three quarter view, right? But the Chinese uh, and indigenous sitters were um, like, you, you wanna see all of your hands and all of your fingers and you face directly forward to the camera. And there's a kind of symbolic value to that. Um, so often the people have their kind of hands placed right on their knees or the tops of their legs. So you see them exactly in a square frame. Uh, which I found fascinating because, you know, there's lots of like a Mughal portraiture, for instance, is all almost always like the very side of the face or, yeah. Yeah, what did you think of that? Well, I, I wish I had seen, well, she had curated a traveling show on C.D. Hoy. I, I don't remember, a while ago. Yeah. Um, and I wish I had been able to see it, but um, C.D. Hoi was one of the first uh, Chinese Canadian photographers um, who was based in the Caribou region. 
um, of BC. And uh, not only did he take portraits of the Chinese communities, but also of the indigenous communities um, all around that area, um, as well as like um, just uh, other marginalized um, communities too. So. No, I, I thought that was a fantastic article because there was just so much that she packed in um, and unpacked too. So. Yeah, yeah, I really agree. I'm really interested um, to hear you talk a little bit about the significance of uh, Cantonese opera because that's another thing that uh, Faith has spent quite a lot of time um, doing scholarship on as well, but that you've included in quite a few of your own exhibitions and mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Cantonese opera was one of the first uh, forms of entertainment available to the um, early Chinese uh, uh, communities in North America. Um, it was also um, you know, one of the forms of self-entertainment. So wild communities actually brought in professional traveling troops from, uh, say, like from Hong Kong or or even from like San Francisco. Um, they also created their own um, clubs and society music groups um, where they would learn to, to play, sing, um, and perform for each other for for the rest of the community, I should say, um, and. Uh, so that's that's partly why I included this work in, or sorry, included excerpts from uh, Cantonese opera within this exhibition, um, to to make that reference and connection, um, and that you know it's an art form that's still being um, performed today. So. Yeah. And this is a kind of interesting discussion that I think is coming up quite a lot. That um, there's. Um, there's a kind of, there's a need and uh, a critical importance in showing um, the way that communities thrive and enjoy themselves and experience joy, as well as talking about um, the ways that communities have experienced things like um, trauma and um, societal racism, especially um, when we're looking at um, underrepresented constituencies um, to be able to show kind of the multiple sides of, of people's lives uh, and how they've, um, to give a more well-rounded experience instead of just this one dimensional um, way of, of looking at certain communities. And I have this question here, um, and I was wondering, Tommy, if, if you would answer as well. Um, do you find yourselves as, as artists and as uh, members of either Indigenous or, or Chinese communities having to carry the burden of erasure and having to shoulder um, or feeling like you have to shoulder the representation of a cultural group? And how do we change that? How do, and how do we combat um, the burnout that, that comes from putting that kind of pressure on artists and makers? Hmm. Well, I guess I, I don't, I'm not feeling any of that kind of pressure. I mean, my, my business, my job, what I do, um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of mostly commissioned work. And when I when I have time on my hands to do my own stuff, then then that's where I get off into a really free form doing doing whatever's in my mind, and I'm able to express it and pull it, bring it out. Um, most most of my work is all is all um, worked out and prescribed ahead of me. I, I I design it, I do it, and for my my clients, but uh, I'm not always having free time to do what you want to do or what I want to do. I hadn't had until really this, this pandemic um, lockdown time that we had here in, in Sitka. Um, and during that time, like I said, I, I was gung ho on my going to finish my canoe, but uh, I totally got distracted and went full on doing um, a ridicule poll first. And then, and then um, um, 11 satire mask or, or I went from satire into um, civil rights leaders and and political prisoners and things that I I, I just took stuff off a complete direction that I've ever done before so I, I don't know if I answered anything here but that, that's where I'm at now I don't know about the other speakers but I'm very curious about the ridicule poll mm -hmm. 
what kind of shapes or characters or the way that you've presented it? Um, well, when, when this, this is uh, pre-pandemic stuff, um, not, I'd never ever been political and, and I don't write our, our representatives and, and do all the email stuff. I, I just, I, but um, I know what I feel, what I see and, and the injustice on, uh, of things that were happening in our country and countries and um, um and so I, I I was moved by our governor of Alaska and our president of the United States back then. This is like uh, three years ago now, but I, I the ridicule poll had our governor on top um, and very cartoonish, and then below below him was a, a well at the bottom was Trump, baby Trump. Um, um, I, I'll, I'll send you images of this because no matter how I describe it, it, it you, you, unless you actually see it, you don't see it. Um, but, it, but I used um, paintboard chalk. This is an 11 and a half foot tall um, log that I carved with a, a, um, a, a tie, a giant tie on one side that said on the top said big tie, big lie. It was what letters that it just said big tie, but then the, the big lie, the lie kind of bleeds through the same, the same lettering and, and says another message and then the giant tie. But I used um, paintboard chalk so I could write interactive, it was an interactive poll. You can write messages on there because above baby Trump had, uh, he has a cell phone in his hand with tw writing, sending out his tweets. Above him was the Twitter birds in black chalkboard <laughs> paint. I did didn't have to make up anything. I just wrote his tweet, tweets directly onto their uh, ridiculous as they were. And then above that was a big balloon area, a bubble area that I could um, write in any message I wanted to. And, and anybody could. It was, like I said, it was interactive and same with, uh, and, and it rotated. It, I, I made a second one that I had in my yard that I hung all my satire mask on that just had Trump on it, but it would rotate, spin around so you could see, uh, I'm standing upright, eight foot tall. One side had the big tie, big lie. The other side had the Twitter birds, the big message board, and a, a little three-foot Trump on the bottom of it with um, imagery. And, and I'd hang all my satire masks. There was a, a satire. One of Trump as the Corona King. Originally, it was Trump's image with a, 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 a Corona, a green crown on his head. And then I added to that later. Um, anyways, I, I would add all, all my masks to, to this interactive board and, and um, I it did get a lot of attention for, for quite a while. And, and then, then I started getting a bunch of attention I didn't want. Um, I'm not the only one that lives in my house. And this stood up in front of my house for, for almost a year. And, and, but then uh, things got crazy and some of these gun-toting, MAGA hat-wearing people and things kind of got scary here. And I'm not the only one that lives in my house. So I took it all down and put it away for now. Sounds like it was a kind of a bomb or a medicine for a while until until it wasn't yes yeah until the yeah your kind of i guess your right to to satirize was also infringed upon yeah but uh, i'm going back uh, i mean i'm going to put all my uh, reassemble my stuff because there's still messages to be told well thank you i can't wait to see pictures of it that sounds amazing how about you karen um, I think, I think there's something about, you know, the past few years where there's more and more, um, folks who are doing, you know, similar work, um, in, uh, so that, you know, it's not just, it's not just placed on one person's shoulder, um, and there's these amazing like young groups, activist group, young art activist groups um, who are just doing so much great work. And I, I think that speaks to like the actions of a collective um, collectivity and, and kind of making change that way. Um, and so that we're all sharing. Um, 
sharing the work, sharing the energy. Um, so yeah, I for me, I don't, I don't feel haven't felt I haven't been burnt out. Um, I think I just I just thrive on this energy <laughs> in a way, and I sometimes you know if I need to, I just step back. Um, and I think it's just through through my work that in I guess through my work I. I'm trying to, how do I say, art is activism in a way. So um, yes, yeah, so it is through my work that I'm doing, um, sharing you know, my thoughts and, and kind of uh, my expressions of, of pushing back. Um, it was amazing for me to see you pivot the exhibition and to use it um, as a kind of platform to talk through your fears and reactions and emotions to the last year and a half and to be able to be a part of that and to see that like from the ground used as a form of activism and a, as a way to you know start these important conversations or um, or like your wishing tree as a place to create safe spaces for people to gather and, and to be able to be together mm -hmm. and to combat some of these things that are happening um, in communities where it's, it's so important for people to continue to be able to um, go to or use as a place to gather. Mm -hmm. I, I really appreciated that. Does anyone have any other questions that they would like to ask? Okay, so I feel like the conversation has kind of come to a natural end. <laughs> um, so I just want to thank you all so, so much for um, your time today, we're all, in, we're in four different time zones. So it was really nice of everyone to coordinate no matter kind of where you are and what you're doing. I know that you're all really busy folks with all these different projects going on. And so I just wanna say thank you so much. I feel like um, people are gonna get a lot out of this conversation. Um, I really enjoy uh, hearing all of you. And I think, um, just thinking from our kind of visitor perspective, sometimes contemporary art can be opaque. It's it's hard to understand how things come to be, how people share ideas or how you move from kind of idea to realization. And I, I really hope that um, this helps people to understand um, that you know, artists, um, even though you might be a kind of solo artist that you're not working in a silo, that you are kind of using a network and, and speaking to other people. Um, um, but that also the kind of the labor that goes into things behind the scenes, I think, Karen, especially your work is seems like this marvel of planning and, and labor. And I'm, I'm always kind of amazed by your work. So I'm, I'm and Tommy, just hearing you talk about a seven year long accumulation of sinew, hide sinew, so that you could put together a piece of work, you know, I'm um, I'm just amazed by, by the kind of time and patience that, that goes into things. And I really appreciate being able to kind of unpack that for people and, and help them to see, see behind the scenes. Well, thank you for, yeah, allowing me to be a part of this. And we I'm glad wish, it worked out. Yeah, me too. And we wish you a safe journey and we hope that Skype was, or uh, Zoom wasn't too, too stressful. <laughs> No, it, it's all good. It's all good. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Helen, for participating in this, and and Tommy for for um, you know for contributing two of your works to the show. I so much appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, it really added such an important dimension, and we are so appreciative that you were willing to um, just consult and and give that that point of perspective. It's been uh, really valued. And thank you for inviting me as well. It's been a, a real pleasure to, well, firstly, to, to meet Tommy by voice. It's been lovely. I tried to contact you a few years ago, but failed. So it's lovely to meet you now, thanks to Karen and Chanel. And uh, thank you, Karen, very much for building upon a meeting that we had a few years ago <laughs> and producing this wonderful piece. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Helen, for being the kind of impetus <laughs> and for, you know, sharing sharing ideas and an, as an academic that aren't necessarily fully formed and, and you know, seeing them grow and, and being a, a kind of part of that discussion and a catalyst for um, new forms of research. That's really important. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.